Hello, my name is John Moyer, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Methods Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the preven prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of the best available methods and to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. You can submit questions during the webinar using the Q&A pod. This can be found by clicking on the three dots at the bottom right corner of your WebEx window. Please direct your questions to all panelists. We will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx at the conclusion of today's talk. The slides and video recording will be posted on our website, prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap in approximately one week. You will receive an email when they are available. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you will be prompted to complete a short evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David M. Murray. Dr. Murray is the Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. He is responsible for promoting and coordinating prevention research among and between NIH institutes and centers and other public and private entities. Dr. Murray joined the NIH after 35 years at the University of Minnesota, the University of Memphis, and The Ohio State University. He has spent his career evaluating interventions designed to improve public health. He is focused on the design and analysis of group or cluster randomized trials in which groups are randomized to conditions and members of those groups are observed to assess the effect of an intervention. Dr. Murray wrote the first textbook on that material, published by Oxford University Press in 1998, and has worked on many such trials, collaborating with colleagues around the country. He served as the first chair of the Community Level Health Promotion Study Section, which reviews many of the group randomized trials submitted to the NIH. He has also conducted research to develop and test new methods for their design and analysis. It is my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Murray to begin today's webinar. Thank you, John, very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today. We are going to talk about design and analytic methods for group-based interventions. Uh, it seems appropriate to define group-based interventions to start with. Uh, these are interventions that are delivered to participants in real or virtual groups or through a shared interventionist or intervention agent. Uh, with group-based interventions, we expect some positive correlation among observations taken on participants who are in the same group. Uh, and these interventions are typically evaluated using a group or cluster randomized trial, an individually randomized group treatment trial, or a stepped wedge group or cluster randomized trial. Um, I will uh, take a moment to talk uh, about uh, the NIH definition of a clinical trial, and then we'll talk about uh, the particular designs uh, that we're going to focus on today, uh, group randomized trials, individually randomized group treatment trials. And then we're going to spend some time looking at the uh, recent updates to the Research Methods Resources website. Uh, the NIH uh, published a revised definition of clinical trial in 2014, um, and the definition is presented here. Uh, the revised definition includes more kinds of studies than the traditional definition that's used in epidemiology or medicine. And what that means is that many studies that were not previously considered clinical trials are actually now considered clinical trials under this definition. And as a result, it's important for all investigators to examine the revised definition and think about whether their trial uh, meets that definition and needs to be dealt with as a clinical trial. Um, uh, if you take a look at these four questions, does your study involve human participants? Are participants prospectively assigned to the intervention? Is the study designed to evaluate the effect of the intervention? And uh, is the effect uh, evaluated against uh, health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes? Those are the key questions. If the answer to all four is yes, then your study is a clinical trial under the NIH definition, and you need to uh, submit your application consistent with the requirements for clinical trials. There's a link shown at the bottom of this slide that will uh, guide you. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, kinds of randomized trials uh, to start with. Um, the randomized clinical trial, traditional randomized clinical trial involves individual randomization to study conditions, and the participants don't have anything to do with each other post-randomization. Most drug trials are examples of this. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see group randomized trials. This is where instead of randomly assigning individuals, we assign groups of some kind uh, to study conditions and then uh, uh, follow uh, the members of those groups over time to see what the effect of the intervention is. Uh, this kind of study is done uh, uh, with many interventions that operate in communities, work sites, schools, clinics, and so forth. We're going to focus on the parallel version of the group randomized trial, and at least uh, for most of today, we're not going to talk about step wedge designs. In the middle is the individually randomized group treatment trial. Here we start uh, like a traditional RCT with individual randomization. Uh, but post-randomization, at least in the intervention arm, um, the participants interact with one another either directly, for example, meeting on Tuesday night in a weight loss class, uh, or uh, perhaps they share an intervention agent. For example, they may have the same surgeon for the procedure that they're about to get. Uh, so these kinds of studies are common in surgical trials and, and behavioral trials. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, group randomized trials. The parallel uh, version is the one that we're going to talk about today, uh, separate but parallel conditions throughout the trial, no crossover. The alternative is the step wedge uh, design, where all groups start in the control condition, all groups cross over to the intervention condition in a random order and on a staggered schedule, uh, so that all groups receive the intervention before the end of the study. As I said, we're not going to talk about that uh, particular design today. Uh, group randomized trials are becoming increasingly common uh, in the uh, medical biomedical literature. You can see here, uh, we didn't have many of these in the literature in the early 90s, but they've grown steadily uh, at, at with the, uh, the highest number, at least in this figure in 2020. Uh, I think that number is going to continue to grow. Uh, these trials are simply uh, 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 very appropriate for certain kinds of uh, interventions, particularly uh, group-based interventions. Um, randomized um, uh, clinical trials uh, have a good opportunity for randomization to distribute potential confounders evenly uh, because these are usually large, uh, large number of units of assignment. If they're well executed, we don't have to worry about confounding. Uh, in parallel group randomized trials, we often have a limited number of units of assignment, so confounding is the rule rather than the exception. And uh, individually randomized group treatment trials, as uh, illustrated on this slide, are in between. It uh, depends on the size. Uh, if we have a lot of participants who are randomized, it may not be an issue. If it's a smaller study, it could be an issue. Uh, the uh, analysis of the data uh, is impacted by the design. Uh, observations on randomized individuals who don't interact with one another are independent and can be analyzed with standard methods. This is the traditional RCT. Uh, you can analyze those data using the methods that you all learned in graduate school. Uh, if you have um, a group randomized trial or an individually randomized group treatment trial, uh, the participants are going to share things in common because of some physical, geographic, social, or other connection, and that creates the expectation for positive intraclass correlation uh, reflecting extra variation that's associated with group membership. Uh, the positive intraclass correlation reduces variation among members of the same group, but uh, it leaves a, a between group component in addition to the within uh, group component, and the total variance is the sum of the two pieces. The intraclass correlation, which is the index that we often use to talk about the degree of correlation among observations taken on members of the same group, uh, is de defined here. It's the fraction of the total variation that's attributable to the group. That fraction is often small, but it can have uh, important effects. Uh, if we have uh, M members in each of G groups, uh, the variance of the group mean is defined uh, in the top row if uh, members are randomly assigned to groups. It's the usual formula, just in notation that, that I use, so it's the usual variance of the dependent variable divided by the number of uh, observations uh, contributing to the mean. 
uh, if group membership is not established by random assignment, that is groups are pre-existing or uh, uh, formed as part of the um, uh, 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 intervention, we can have um, a slightly different formula as shown in the middle. Uh, the group component of variance is not divided by the number of observations contributing to the mean. Uh, and uh, when we rewrite that in perhaps a more familiar expression at the bottom, you see it's the usual variance of the group mean multiplied by a variance inflation factor, this parenthetical expression, one plus and minus one times the ICC. Um, and that uh, uh, term, that parenthetical piece, will get large to the extent that the interclass correlation is large or the number of observations per group is large. Uh, nested factors uh, must be modeled as random effects. This goes back to a paper by David Zucker published in 1990. Uh, the variance of any group level statistic is going to be larger and the degrees of freedom uh, available uh, are going to be limited. Uh, this is uh, uh, almost always true in a group randomized trial and often true in an individually randomized group treatment trial. If you ignore those issues, if you ignore the extra uh, variation or the limited degrees of freedom, you're going to have an inflated type 1 error rate. And that's the problem. Uh, the type 1 error rate might be 50%, not 5%, and no one wants that. Uh, in an individually randomized group treatment trial, it might be 25% instead of 5%. Nobody wants that. So you need to deal with these issues up front as you're planning the study, because if you don't, uh, you're not going to have the power that you're going to want at the end of the day. Uh, Jerry Cornfield uh, published a piece in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 1978, which I uh, think is a very nice uh, and concise statement, randomization by cluster accompanied by an analysis appropriate to randomization by individual is an exercise in self-deception and should be discouraged. So you will have all, you have now all been warned, um, uh, please don't do that. Uh, uh, we'll continue to talk about the appropriate methods. And though Cornfield's original remarks were only addressed to group randomized trials, they certainly also apply to individually randomized group treatment trials. Um, uh, these uh, designs, uh, though they carry uh, some extra uh, baggage, are still very important. Uh, the RCT is certainly the best comparative design if we can have individual randomization without interaction uh, post-randomization. But the two alternatives that we're talking about here, the IRGT and the GRT, are the best comparative designs when uh, there is uh, post-randomization interaction or when we're allocating uh, uh, intact social groups of some kind. Um, how do we choose among these designs? Well, this uh, figure appeared in a paper that we published uh, a year ago uh, in the Annual Review of Public Health. And uh, let me just walk you through the three questions that uh, investigators should consider to decide which of the designs is appropriate. The first question, is there a strong rationale for randomizing groups rather than individuals? If the answer to that question is no, uh, then we move on to the second question. Do participants receive their treatment in a group format or from a shared interventionist? If the answer to that question is also no, then uh, we have a, a traditional randomized clinical trial. We don't need to worry about these other issues. Uh, if the answer to that second question is yes, we have an individually randomized group treatment trial. If going back to the first question, there is strong rationale for randomizing groups rather than individuals, and often that rationale might be, oh, geez, I'm really concerned about contamination. I don't want the intervention and control conditions operating in the same school or the same physician's office or the same hospital. Uh, so contamination concerns often drive us towards uh, randomizing groups. If the answer to that question is yes, then we can consider the third question, is there a strong rationale for rolling out the intervention to all groups before the end of the trial? If the answer to that question is no, we have the parallel group randomized trial. If the answer to that question is yes, we have a step wedge design. Uh, so those three questions can lead you through uh, the uh, alternative designs. Uh, let's consider for uh, a few minutes the preferred analytic models for parallel group randomized trials that have one or two time intervals in the uh, analysis plan. This could be a post-test only design. It could be a pre-test, post-test design. Uh, either of those would qualify. Uh, it could also be a design that has a pre-test, a post-test, a one-year follow-up, a two-year follow-up, and a three-year follow-up, as long as I'm only going to look at two of those time points in the analysis. Uh, so the critical thing here is one or two time intervals that are included in the analysis. Uh, if 
this is the situation, then I can use um, quite readily mixed model uh, uh, regression procedures, uh, often referred to as mixed model ANOVA and COVA procedures. Uh, they are an extension of the usual ANOVA and COVA based on the general linear model, but here they're based on the generalized or general linear mixed model. Uh, the advantage of these uh, methods is that they can accommodate regression adjustment for covariates. Uh, they can't misrepresent overtime correlation because there is only one uh, time interval uh, from pretest to post-test or from pretest to three-year follow-up. Um, they can take several different forms, and any of these uh, are uh, acceptable. Simulations have shown that these methods have the nominal type 1 error rate across a wide variety of conditions that are common in group randomized trials. When we have more than two time intervals that we're uh, concerned about, so uh, this could be the situation where we have pre-test, post-test, one-year follow-up, two-year follow-up, three-year follow-up, and we want to look at all of the data at the same time. We want to look at all of those time points in the same analysis. Uh, then my uh, recommendation for more than 20 years has been random coefficients models. Uh, these are sometimes called growth curve models. Uh, the difference is that the uh, that time is modeled in this kind of analysis as a continuous variable rather than as a categorical variable. In the mixed model ANOVA and COVA, time is categorical, uh, often represented by dummy-coded indicator variables. In the random coefficients or growth curve approach, time is modeled as a continuous variable. Um, the reason uh, that we need to use uh, these different approaches is that the mixed model ANOVA and ANCOVA assumes homogeneity of the trends that are specific to each group, um, we can't test that assumption uh, within the context of the mixed model ANOVA and COVA. And simulations have shown that if that homogeneity does not exist, if the group specific trends vary, uh, we'll have an inflated type 1 error rate. Uh, the random coefficients model allows for as much heterogeneity in those uh, group specific trends as might be there. Uh, and simulations have shown that. Uh, uh, that particular approach uh, carries the nominal type 1 error rate across a wide range of conditions that are common in group randomized trials. Um, uh, what about individually randomized group treatment trials? Well, it, it, these studies uh, may not have an interclass correlation at the beginning. So when we first uh, collect baseline data, perhaps uh, before randomization or immediately after randomization, um, the participants haven't met with one another. They haven't interacted with one another. So at baseline, the expectation is no interclass correlation. But as the study goes on and participants, at least in the intervention arm, meet with one another in their Tuesday night uh, weight loss class or their Saturday morning smoking cessation class, or perhaps they meet uh, in a virtual chat room, uh, or perhaps they share the same surgeon, uh, we expect a correlation in later data uh, among participants who share the same interventionist or are in the same intervention group. And if we ignore that uh, interclass correlation, uh, we can land in the same uh, trouble with an inflated type 1 error rate uh, as we have in a group randomized trial. Uh, the magnitude of the problem isn't usually as large, but it's still substantial and something we want to avoid. Uh, the solution is quite similar to the, to the one that we have in group randomized trials. We analyze the data to reflect the variation attributable to the groups uh, that are defined either by the way the intervention is delivered or the, the patterns of the interaction among the members uh, of those groups. And we base the degrees of freedom on the number of groups, not strictly the number of members. In an individually randomized group treatment trial, we often have small groups of some kind in the intervention arm and no groups in the control arm. In that case, we can have lots of degrees of freedom from the control arm because it's based on the number of participants, but a limited number of degrees of freedom in the intervention arm because it's based on the number of groups. The total degrees of freedom for the intervention effect is just the sum of the two. Uh, and in that circumstance, we usually have plenty because we usually have quite a few people in the control group or the control arm. Uh, I want to point to a paper by Candlish 2018 uh, who provides code in several different uh, data analysis packages uh, that can be used for analyzing individually randomized group treatment trials. So Candlish 2018 uh, from um, BMC Medical Research Methodology. Um, one of the things that can happen, uh, this slide is titled IRGT trials, but it, it can also happen in group randomized trials. Um, 
it is perhaps more common in individually randomized group treatment trials, but it can happen in both. Uh, the literature assumes that each member belongs to just one, one group for purposes of intervention. Uh, the student always attends the same school or the participant is always going to the Saturday morning weight loss class. Um, uh, this, uh, not surprisingly, isn't reality in many cases. Uh, we, we may have students who change schools. We may have participants who need to switch to the Tuesday morning class instead of the Saturday morning class because their work schedule changed. Things like that can happen in real life. Um, so um, uh, if um, uh, participants change groups over time or uh, participate in more than one small group uh, for intervention purposes over time, uh, and we ignore that, uh, we can uh, have an inflated type 1 error rate uh, even if we've paid attention to the other issues. So the, here are three papers cited, uh, Robertson, Wallman, uh, Luau et al., and Sturba, uh, describing uh, respectively cross-classified models, multiple membership models, dy dynamic group models, and these are different approaches that can be used to address these complex design features. Um, so if, if you are looking at a study that has uh, uh, changing group structure over time, I, I encourage you or your methodologist to take a look at those papers and be, become familiar with those issues. Uh, let's talk for a little bit about uh, power and, and precision. Um, the variance of a condition mean in a parallel group randomized trial uh, is based on the formula shown here. This is for a, a continuous outcome. Uh, we take the variance of the uh, at the individual level, the usual variance of the dependent variable. We divide by the number of observations contributing to the condition mean. And in my notation, that's M times G. We have M members per group. We have G groups per condition. So MG participants per condition. We multiply that by the variance inflation factor that we talked about earlier. Uh, uh, that gets larger as the ICC gets larger or as M gets larger. Uh, and that is the variance of the condition mean. Um, we want to make that as small as possible. And you can look at the formula and see ways to make it small. You can make it small by having a small ICC. You can, you can make it small by reducing the uh, variance uh, of the dependent variable. You can make it small by having more groups. Um, uh, adding more members uh, uh, is kind of a mixed bag. It's in the denominator over here, but it's in the numerator here. So uh, you get a lot more uh, bang for the buck, if you will, out of reducing the variance or increasing the number of groups or reducing the interclass correlation than you do out of adding members. And we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so uh, the, the three things that I always recommend to people as they're planning these studies and think about, thinking about them is have plenty of groups, uh, a sufficient number of members, um, have uh, reduced the variation in your outcome measures as much as you can through covariance adjustment or standardization or other procedures, and try to make the interclass correlation go away, or at least make it smaller. Uh, we can rarely make it go away, but we can often make it smaller, uh, and uh, we can usually do that through regression adjustment for covariates, so that's a, a procedure that I recommend. Let's look at um, this slide that shows uh, the detectable difference on the y-axis uh, as a function of the number of groups per condition. Those are the, the various colored lines uh, and members per group on the uh, x-axis. So uh, if you think about uh, intervention effects in standard deviation units or uh, detectable differences in standard deviation units, usually we're, we're interested in effects that are 0.2 to 0.5 standard deviation units in magnitude, pretty small. So it's it's down in the lower part of this uh, uh, figure in terms of the y-axis. Um, when I'm giving this lecture to a live audience, I often ask how many of you have had an intervention study where the intervention effect was two standard deviation units? Nobody ever raises their hand. Um, and if I asked if how many have had a, a study where the intervention effect was one standard deviation unit, and not many would raise their hand. So these intervention effects are not common. Um, uh, the plausible intervention effect between 0.2 and 0.5, you need a pretty good size study if your interclass correlation is as large as it is here, 0.1. That's a very large interclass correlation, at least in a group randomized trial. Um, and you do need a pretty large study in that circumstance. If the interclass correlation gets uh, smaller here, 
reduced by an order of magnitude. So if I bounce back and forth, you can see all the lines drop uh, substantially, especially the upper lines. Um, and now we can uh, find reasonable detectable differences with a much more modestly sized study. Uh, another pattern to notice, both in this slide and in the uh, previous slide, is that you get some benefit for additional members per group uh, for up to a point. On this slide, after about 100, you don't get much more benefit out of it. On uh, this slide, you continue to get benefit up to perhaps 200, uh, and then after that, it doesn't help very much. This is because M is in both the numerator and the denominator of the variance inflation factor. And so, yes, you get some benefit, but not as much as you would adding more groups. Uh, if we drop the magnitude of the interclass correlation, another order of magnitude uh, to 0.001, the lines drop further. It's, it's not really going to matter if I drop the ICC even further. It, it, the lines don't move very much. But uh, once you get down to this range on the ICC scale, uh, you've done a very good job, and it's not going to uh, hurt you too much. Uh, power for um, parallel group randomized trials, we need to adapt the usual methods. Uh, the variance is larger, as I showed you. The degrees of freedom are based on the number of groups. There, there's a large literature now showing how to do this and showing methods. And a good resource um, is this uh, provided in, in this link to the NIH Research Methods Resources website. We've had a calculator up since, I think, 2017 uh, that lets you do sample size calculations for group randomized trials. Uh, power for individually randomized group treatment trials uh, depends on some of the same factors uh, as in a group randomized trial. It depends on the ICC. It depends on the number of groups in the intervention condition. And uh, it also depends on the number of members in each of those groups. And it depends on the number of members in the control condition, uh, if you have groups in only one arm. Uh, if you have groups in both arms, you're really dealing with what amounts to a group randomized trial for purposes of sample size calculation, and you ought to go back and use the sample size calculator for group randomized trials. But if you have uh, groups, small groups only in one condition, then the IRGT uh, sample size calculator can be used. Um, methods for sample size calculation have been published, and there's a series of references here. And we recently added a sample size calculator for individually randomized group treatment trials on our research methods uh, resources website. I want to mention uh, that unbalanced designs are important to think about. Um, I spent, uh, oh, maybe the first 15 years or so that I was working on studies like this, working very hard to avoid unbalanced designs. And by an unbalanced design, I mean a design where the groups vary widely in size. Uh, Leslie Kish was a colleague and friend. Uh, he wrote one of the seminal survey sampling textbooks in 1965 and was at the University of Michigan uh, when I uh, knew him. Um, and I think really throughout most of his career. Uh, he advised me that, David, as long as the largest group is no more than twice the size of the smallest group, you really don't have to worry about variability in group size. So I, st I stuck to that principle and, and uh, tried to avoid situations where the largest was more than twice as large as the smallest. But increasingly, we're seeing studies where the, the largest might be 20 times the size of the smallest. So considerable variability in group size. Those are what I'm calling unbalanced designs. Most of the uh, methods for sample size and data analysis assume, assume balanced data. Uh, and uh, if you have more extreme imbalance than this two to one ratio, uh, you could have an inflated type one error rate if, you're, uh, if you ignore it in the analysis. And it certainly will reduce power if you ignore it in the sample size calculation. So if you're looking at a situation where you're probably going to have considerable variability in your group size, uh, you're going to need to pay attention to that. Uh, and consult with a methodologist who's familiar with that issue. Uh, we have a number of resources that are available um, uh, from NIH. Uh, there's a seven-part uh, online course for group randomized trials and individually randomized group treatment trials. We will supplement that course later this year and add a section on step wedge designs. Um, we have a series of Mind the Gap webinars uh, covering topics related to uh, group-based interventions. And of course, there's the Research Methods Resources website. And we're going to turn to that now. So this is a screenshot from that website. This is what you'll see if you uh, follow the link on the 
previous slide. So if you go to researchmethodsresources.nih.gov, uh, you'll see this screen. Uh, this is the home page. Um, and uh, the website is focused entirely on uh, design and analytic methods for group-based uh, interventions. Right now, it, it deals exclusively with group randomized trials and individually randomized group treatment trials. Uh, we are developing a, a new section on step wedge uh, group randomized or cluster randomized trials, and uh, that will be uh, added later this year, uh, both the kind of material that we have for um, uh, as background for group randomized and individually randomized group treatment trials and a sample size calculator. And John Moyer, who uh, introduced me uh, for this presentation, is actually the statistician who's developing all that material. So uh, you can thank Jonathan when that becomes available. Um, the landing side uh, gives you an introductory webinar if you're interested. Uh, there's a methods tab that lets you dis distinguish between uh, group randomized and individually randomized group treatment. Later, it will also distinguish with step wedge. The tools is where you'd go for the sample size calculator or calculators. And the reference materials tab is where you'd go to find references, uh, frequently asked uh, questions and answers, and uh, a glossary of terms. So uh, also on this, um, uh, uh, this is the page if you go to methods. Uh, so we have a little description about what uh, group uh, and uh, or cluster randomized trials are and what individually randomized group treatment trials are. We've already talked about that, so we don't need to dwell on it. Uh, a, a very popular feature on this website are the sample size calculators. Uh, the GRT sample size calculator, as I said, has been there for three and a half years or so. We've had lots of visitors and pretty good feedback on it. The individually randomized group treatment trial sample size calculator was introduced uh, only uh, uh, a number of weeks ago, so we have less experience with it. It is patterned very much after the GRT sample size calculator, so it has the same look and feel, uh, operates in much the same way. So if you've used the group randomized trial sample size calculator, I think the RGT sample size calculator will be relatively easy to adjust to. This is the landing page for the group randomized trial sample size calculator. And you can see on the left, um, the various topics that you'll be asked to uh, provide information on. You'll need to specify type one and uh, error rate and the power that you're seeking. You'll need to uh, describe the expected distribution of the primary outcome. Uh, and and uh, for our purposes, that's either continuous or dichotomous. Uh, you'll need to identify the design and analytic plan. Is it a uh, uh, post-test only, is it pre-post? Um, you'll need to specify an interclass correlation uh, for the outcome variable that you're going to use. How many members or participants uh, on average are there in each group? Do you intend to use regression adjustment for covariates as a method to uh, either reduce the uh, residual variance or reduce the interclass correlation because it can serve both purposes? And for the group randomized trials sample size calculator, we ask about stratification and matching because this sample size calculator supports those features. Uh, you can size a stratified design or a matched design, and it could be a priori stratified or post hoc stratified. You can do uh, any of those uh, uh, variations with the GRT sample size calculator. And then finally, you specify the uh, analytic plan and generate the results to your calculation. Uh, the other thing that you'll see in the upper left uh, corner, uh, right under the title for this slide, view worked examples. There's a link. Uh, we updated the material uh, a few months ago and added worked examples to this sample size calculator. They had not been there before. Uh, and if, if this were a live link and I clicked on it, it would take you to a list of, uh, uh, I think it's a dozen worked examples that uh, use the various designs that are supported by the sample size calculator. And you can see the formulas that underline the, the methods, and you can see a worked example. And uh, those are going to be helpful to people who are trying to understand you know, how this works inside the box. So I encourage you to take a look at that. If we go to the individually randomized group treatment trial uh, sample size calculator, this is the new one. It's laid out in very much the same way. Um, we have worked examples provided. Uh, and you'll actually get to see some of that in a few minutes. We ask for the type 1 error rate and power. We ask for the expected distribution of the primary outcome. 
We ask for the design and analytic plan, uh, for the interclass correlation, for the number of members or participants in the control arm, and in the groups in the intervention arm. Um, we asked about regression adjustment for covariates. We ask about analytic plans, and then we generate results. What's missing here that we had in the group randomized trial sample size calculator is stratification and matching. Uh, so this sample size calculator doesn't support that. Uh, they are far less uh, common in terms of being taken into account in the analysis in the IRGTs, um, uh, though they may still be used uh, for purposes of balance uh, in the allocation of participants to arms, uh, but, but that is not a feature that's currently supported in this particular calculator. So this is uh, an example of what you'll see if you select worked examples. Um, this is for an IRGT uh, where uh, we're looking at a simple difference. So uh, it's post-test only data. Uh, it may be a pre-test, -pre post-test design uh, where we're adjusting for the baseline value, but we're the, the only time point that's being analyzed on the dependent variable side is the post-test. Uh, here's the formula that, that underlies this sample size calculator. Uh, and you'll see this formula in, in a number of publications uh, from various uh, investigators that have looked at sample size for individually randomized group treatment trials. Um, this uses the notation that I have used for years uh, in my writing. Others uh, obviously would use different notation, but the formula is consistent across sources. Um, and there's a, uh, the text that uh, is immediately below the equation defines all the terms. So um, I'm not going to do that here, but you can uh, see it if you go to the page. Um, as an example, and this is the worked example that you see, uh, in the rest of the pages of that worked example. Uh, let's consider an individually randomized group treatment trial that has these characteristics. We're going to have 50 observations in the control arm. So it's a small study, 50 observations in the control arm. Um, we're going to have five small groups in the intervention arm, each with 10 participants. So it's balanced in terms of intervention versus control with 50 and 50. Uh, but in the control arm, the 50 participants don't have any, any interaction with one another. In the intervention arm, we have uh, five small groups, uh, each with 10 participants. And uh, as a real world example, perhaps our intervention has to do with physical therapy and the groups are defined by the physical therapists. So perhaps we have five physical therapists and they're each seeing 10 patients. So that's, an ex that's a, a, a concrete example of how this might translate. Um, we want to make some regression adjustment for covariates and we have, uh, we're gonna use four degrees of freedom for member level covariates. Uh, and we're gonna use one degree of freedom for uh, a group level covariate. Uh, and then the, the formula for degrees of freedom is shown here. Uh, the number of participants in the control arm minus one plus the number of groups minus one, minus the degrees of freedom in total used for uh, covariates, and we end up with 48 in this example. Um, for a two-tailed type, uh, two type one error rate of 5%, um, I can look up uh, the alpha level um, in the, in the, or the t-value in the uh, uh, t-table and get 2.0106, and the uh, t-value for 80% power is 0.8492. Uh, so those uh, are specified by my time point error rate, uh, the number of arms that I have, and the power that I want. I'm going to define the variance as one. I'm just going to work in standard deviation units. Uh, you can work in the natural units of the dependent variable if you want, or you can work in standard deviation units. It does not matter. Uh, I'm going to use an interclass correlation of 0.05. Now, if you're writing a grant application, please explain where your interclass correlation coefficient estimate came from. And don't say, well, David Murray used 0.05 in his webinar, so that's the number I'm going to use. Um, that may not satisfy the reviewers. They're looking for an estimate that reflects the kind of data that you're going to have with the kind of outcome you're going to have and the kind of participants you're going to have, and that's not necessarily 0.05. 0.05 turns out to be a uh, conservative number for many individually randomized group treatment trials. On the other hand, it may be too small for other individually randomized group treatment trials. So it is not a number that should be used uh, universally. You need to uh, try to come up with a data-based estimate. Uh, in this example, I'm assuming that we're going to shrink the um, uh, 
uh, uh, variance components uh, by 30% uh, at the member level and 10% uh, at the group level through our regression adjustment for covariates, and that's uh, the R squareds that are specified. Then this is the same formula that we saw a minute ago, uh, but we've dropped in all the values and done the arithmetic. And this tells us that, that with 50 in the control arm and five physical therapists, each seeing 10 patients, uh, we have power for a, uh, an intervention effect of 0.55 standard deviation units. And if we're comfortable with that, fine, we go ahead with that, with that uh, proposal. Uh, if we think that intervention effect is too large and we need to be able to detect something smaller, then we need to modify the parameters. And uh, my recommendation is increase the number of groups. That will always be my recommendation because you'll get more out of that than you will increasing the number of members in each group or the number of members in the control arm. But you can increase any of those three numbers uh, and your intervention effect will get smaller. Um, uh, and um, to the same level of power, and you may be able to make a better, a more convincing argument in your grant application that you're pursuing a plausible uh, intervention effect. Um, if we had worked through that example inside the sample size calculator, we'd, we'd eventually get to the results page. And the first thing that the results page presents is the, the power for the specified intervention effect based on the parameter estimates. Now, when I work this example in the sample size calculator, I put an intervention effect in of 0 0.2 standard deviation units. That is generally considered to be a small intervention effect, but it, it's at the, the low end of the range that we typically look for in biomedical research. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, usually from 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 standard deviation unit intervention effects. So I put in 0 0.2, and if we only have 50 participants in the control arm, and five groups with 10 each in the intervention arm, our power is quite limited for an intervention effect of 0.2 standard deviation units. It's only 0.17. That's nowhere near 0.8. Um, uh, we've already seen that we have 80% power for an intervention effect uh, of about 0.55, but nowhere near that for an intervention effect of 0.2. And you get this note uh, alerting you that the power is low, uh, and encouraging you to consider increasing the number of groups in the intervention condition, increasing the number of members in each group, or the number of members in the control condition. And the text cautions you, and I would caution you, don't just go in and reduce the intra-class correlation so that the results look better. Uh, uh, you, need to ha you need to be able to defend your intra-class correlation estimate. It needs to be based on data, uh, and you shouldn't just change it so that the, you get the answer, an answer that looks good. Uh, this is also part of the uh, report that you get uh, at the end of the sample size calculation. This table is patterned after tables that I used to put in my own grant applications. Uh, I often like to do this. I could present a table that showed um, at the center uh, where it says 0.5449, that's the intervention effect that I can get with the design that I'm uh, uh, proposing. Five groups per condition, 50 members uh, in the control condition, uh, and that's the effect that I can get. This table shows that if I increase the number of groups, the intervention effect gets smaller. If I decrease the number of groups, the intervention effect gets smaller, or, or sorry, larger. Uh, and, and similarly with uh, increasing and decreasing the number of members in the control condition, it gives you a, it's, a, it's essentially a sensitivity analysis for the power calculation. And you could literally pick that up and drop it into your grant application. You can download the results that come out of the sample size calculator into Word or into Excel or as a PDF, and then uh, use them as you wish. You can go, um, you can back up and change values uh, along the way and then uh, continue forward uh, and get a new set of results. You can save results. Uh, you can go through this uh, process as many times as you like. Uh, uh, the next, this slide and the next two show detectable differences at 80% power um, as a function of the number of groups per condition and the number of members in the control condition and as a function of the ICC. So this is a large ICC, 0.2, it's pretty ugly. Uh, and you need pretty large effects if you're not going to have many groups or a, a lot of groups if you want to go after smaller uh, effects. 
and this is presented as much as a warning as anything. Uh, you, you, if you have a large ICC, you either need large intervention effects or a lot of small groups. Uh, if we look at the next slide in the series, we've cut the, the intraclass correlation in half to 0.1, and things are better. And if we go forward again to 0.05, things are even better. Now we can find plausible intervention effects, uh, even with a modest number of groups uh, in the intervention condition. Um, so in, in sum, a, a parallel group randomized trial is the best comparative design if you've got a particular kind of intervention. It operates at a group level, manipulates the social or physical environment, or can't be delivered to individuals. Individually randomized group treatment trials uh, uh, are uh, used when we have an intervention that uh, is best delivered in a group format, but we can start with individual randomization. These trials are very widely used. You'd be very surprised how many are out there, but they're rarely, rarely recognized as individually randomized group treatment trials. Most are designed and analyzed, ignoring the interclass correlation that's there in the data, uh, which means that the type 1 error rate is uh, typically larger than uh, what the investigators think it might be. Um, investigators new to these methods, I encourage you to collaborate with more experienced people, exper especially experienced methodologists. Here's uh, the link again to the Research Methods uh, Resources website. And coming later this year, we're going to have a section on step wedge group or cluster randomized trials uh, added to this uh, website along with a sample size calculator, and you'll be able to uh, uh, use it. So I will stop there, and I'm happy to uh, take questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marie. Uh, we have several questions from the audience. So uh, well, Begin with. Um, I see um, questions in the um, Q and A box, and I see questions in the um, chat box. Yes, I'm trying um, to size those a little bit. Um, one question was: If individuals are nested within a cluster, such as students within a class, but randomization occurs at the end. Jonathan, individual I don't know if you want to participate in the Q and A portion, or if your audio is working. I'm not hearing you, so I'm going to proceed. Um, a recording of the video and the slides uh, will be posted on our website in about a week. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if individuals are nested within a cluster, for example, students within a class, but randomization occurs at an individual level, do we still need to adjust for interclass correlation? Uh, uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, so we might use classes as a uh, stratification factor and randomize within a class to intervention and control. Uh, and in that case, uh, we can either include the class as a fixed effect if we want to and try to reduce the error variance and improve power, or we can ignore it. That's, that's up to us. Uh, but we don't have to pay attention to an interclass correlation because we're not expecting one associated with the class. The difference is here that the, um, uh, what might be considered the cluster the class is crossed with the arms uh, of the intervention conditions. So it's uh, you have both intervention and control in the same class. And if, if that's true in the same school or the same work site or the same hospital, it's a stratified RCT. It is not a cluster randomized trial. And you can ignore the clustering because it's, it's not there. Um, what would you recommend if the fixed effect for time is not easily represented as continuous? Um, uh, if um, if you can't measure time uh, as a continu continuous variable, then obviously you're going to need to treat it categorically. Um, and if you, uh, the, the, the constraint there is um, uh, I would not try to analyze more than two time intervals at the same time in a given analysis um, because it won't work. Or, or, or sorry, it will work, but you'll, you'll probably have an inflated type 1 error rate. So in that circumstance, analyze uh, maybe the two-year follow-up adjusting for baseline, and then separately analyze the five-year follow-up adjusting for baseline. If you try to analyze baseline two-year and five-year all in one analysis with uh, time as categorical, uh, you run the risk of an inflated type 1 error rate. Um, someone uh, offers an observation. I was taught if the ICC is lower than 0.02, uh, then conducting uh, HLM or including random coefficients is not needed. I disagree with that. Um, I'm sorry that you were taught that way, but I, I would respectfully disagree with your instructor. 
uh, it depends on how many members are in each of the groups that you're dealing with. If you have, you know, a handful of members, four or five, six, seven, then an ICC of 0.02 isn't going to make much difference. If you have uh, hundreds, like a school-based study, it's going to make a big difference. Um, so uh, 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 I think you need to attend to the interclass correlation, no, no matter how large it is. Um, okay. The site for the resources, is it freely accessible? The uh, Research Methods Resources website is uh, uh, freely available. Um, and it's an NIH website. You can uh, go to it. Uh, we've provided the link in several of the slides. And if you go to uh, the NIH website and just search for Research Methods Resources, you'll find it. Uh, we will send the slides out, of course, in a week. Uh, our site does not support observational studies. Uh, uh, this site supports trials. Um, OK, we have a, a question that I encounter uh, often. Um, would you say a bit more about how, in an individually randomized group treatment trial, individuals interacting in their groups is considered a problem? In uh, cognitive behavioral group therapy, it's considered part and parcel of the treatment. I, I agree, it's part of the treatment. I understand that. Uh, but statistically, we can't treat the individuals that participate in those group therapy sessions as independent. They've been interacting with one another. If the interaction is considered to be a vital, essential part of the intervention, then you have to allow it. You have to uh, include it. I'm not arguing that you should not. But we can't ignore it when it comes time for the analysis. And we shouldn't ignore it uh, in the sample size calculation. Um, um, the methods that I've described for group and individually randomized group treatment trials uh, here today would apply in that circumstance. Uh, and uh, psychology is one of the areas that has, uh, uh, for years, decades, I would argue, published individually randomized group treatment trials with the wrong analysis. Uh, where they've ignored uh, the therapist effect. And there's a fairly substantial literature on therapist effects in the, in the psychology literature. And increasingly, in more recent years, people are recognizing that it's an, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, sorry, every time uh, a new question comes in, it moves my uh, scroll, and I've lost uh, uh, where I was going through this section. Um, Group, uh, uh, why group randomized trial instead of cluster randomized trial? Uh, they mean the same thing. Um, uh, if you want an answer to that question, it's because I wrote the book on group randomized trials, and Alan Donner wrote the book on cluster randomized trials, and we use different terms. But he and I are good friends. We're old friends. I use these terms interchangeably. They mean exactly the same thing. Uh, he's done a better job at persuading people to refer to these as cluster randomized than I ever did. Uh, persuading people to refer to them as group randomized. So uh, you hear the cluster randomized more often. They are the same. There, there's no uh, distinction. Um, is there a sample size calculator for crossover design? We don't have one on our website. You can find uh, calculators for crossover designs on other websites, but not. Uh, we have not uh, had one on ours. And uh, it's because uh, they are not as common as the uh, non-crossover non designs. Now, the exception that, that we will address very soon is the step wedge design. In the step wedge design, all the groups start in the control condition and then gradually, sequentially move over to the intervention condition. So they are crossing over from control to intervention in a, in a sequence, uh, often a random sequence. And uh, we will provide uh, methods for step wedge designs uh, along with a sample size calculator on uh, this website uh, later this year. Uh, don't have a firm date on that, but uh, soon. Um, can we comment on Monte Carlo uh, power calculation, uh, simulation-based uh, power calculations? Uh, this is a perfectly fine method. Uh, lots of investigators use it. Uh, I see it often in the context of um, a group uh, randomized trials or step wedge designs or individually randomized group treatment trials, especially for more complicated designs uh, where the standard calculators just don't quite work. 
um, uh, simulation methods can certainly be used. It's very important to think hard about the parameter estimates that you're using in those simulations. You want them to reflect the data that you're going to have uh, uh, and not just be arbitrarily uh, selected uh, parameter estimates. But uh, if you've got good uh, estimates for the uh, important parameters, you can certainly use uh, simulation-based sample size calculations. Um, another question, we've always had significant imbalance between group between groups on individual factors at baseline. Yes, that's that's part of why paying attention to groups is important. Um, the uh, people weren't randomly assigned to uh, schools or clinics or uh, work sites, uh, the units that we're gonna randomize. Uh, people self-selected themselves to see that physician or to go work in that factory or to attend that school. And so they tend to be more similar to one another than they are to people in other schools. And hence, hence you see between group uh, differences on individual level factors. Uh, that is not surprising at all. Um, my advice is think about what those might be in advance. Uh, if you can, uh, based on your prior experience or uh, the prior experience of others that are members of your team, if you can identify what those factors are, you can measure them, include them in your surveys, include them in your data collection methods. And then uh, you can not only look and see that, yes, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there are differences between groups on those factors, you can adjust for them. And if they're measured at an individual level, it doesn't cost you anything in terms of degrees of freedom in a group randomized trial. You can adjust for four or five, six of them. Uh, always uh, good to specify in advance what they're gonna be if you can, uh, but you can adjust for them. And that will usually serve two purposes. One, it's one of the best ways to make the interclass correlation smaller and that's going to help power a lot. And it tends to, in addition, reduce the residual variance, which further improves power. So I'm a big advocate for regression adjustment for covariates measured at an individual level in a group treatment trial, or sorry, a, a group randomized trial. Uh, and it can also be helpful in an individually randomized group treatment trial. Um, are, do I have any recommendations for power analyses for mediated treatment effects in an IRGT? I, I do not. Um, uh, David McKinnon is my go-to person on mediation, and um, I should talk to him and see uh, uh, if we could develop something related to that. But at this point, uh, we do not have it. Um, Um, please clarify the effect of cluster size and cluster randomized trials with, um, I'm not, uh, the question is a little, is a, a little unclear to me. I'm trying to understand it. Uh, we've got 300 people per cluster. Um, we're studying these clusters in, um, different countries. Each, each country is contributing a bunch of different clusters. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't, I'm not sure if that's a randomized study. If you're randomizing within cluster, um, then you can treat the cluster as a stratification factor. I talked about that earlier. If you're randomly assigning clusters within countries, you can teach you can treat the countries as a stratification factor. And then the cluster is the unit of assignment, and it's a group or cluster randomized trial. Um, and it's great if you've got the same number of participants in each cluster, you avoid the issues that you get into with imbalance. Um, and how would this be different compared to a smaller number of participants per cluster or fewer clusters? So uh, um, the, the two most important factors in power in a, a group or cluster randomized trial are the number of uh, groups and the magnitude of the interclass correlation. So shrinking the number of groups is almost always going to hurt power, uh, and I discourage it. Um, having more members up to a point helps, but after you've got about 150 or so in each group, adding a lot more members doesn't help very much. It'd be far more economical, more efficient to add a few more groups. Uh, that would help you more. Um, so uh, you don't necessarily need 300 per cluster. You could probably get away with 150. Um, I was involved in the Minnesota Heart Health Program in the 80s where we had thousands and thousands of people in each of six towns, and that was a terrible plan. We just didn't understand it in 1980. Um, it would have been far better to have had a couple hundred in each of a bunch of towns instead of thousands in each of six. Um, 
we're just about out of time, and I'm sorry that I haven't gotten through all the um, questions, uh, but I hope I hope we've gotten through a number of them. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar. Um, you can find the resources for this talk and many others on the Mind the Gap website. That's prevention.nih.gov slash Mind the Gap. Resources include the slides, references, and the recording, and we will post the materials from this particular webinar in about a week. You'll get an email with a link uh, to the recording when it becomes available. And this concludes today's Mind the Gap webinar broadcast. Uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.